The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the morning mail, did you receive a postcard from your Equitable Society representative? If so, consider yourself highly complimented. Your equitable man picked you as a man or woman who's most likely to succeed. A person who's sure to be interested in the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. In about 14 minutes, I'll give you full details on this special plan for every person who has faith in himself and his future. It is offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, The Delinquent Doctor. If a gong should ring throughout America every time a major crime is committed, perhaps it would bring home more graphically the tremendous number of crimes inflicted upon us by our legion of criminals. Last year, the total of those major crimes exceeded the million and a half mark, which means they came at intervals of more than three a minute every day throughout the 12 months. Now we are beginning a new year, a year which can start the decline in the price of crime for the decent people of the nation. Ten years ago, the Federal Bureau of Investigation undertook a survey to find the exact price each of us paid toward the crime bill. The result of that survey showed that every responsible citizen's contribution was $120 per year. In those 10 years, the price of everything has skyrocketed, with crime being no exception. Your FBI does not have any easy answer to the problem, but it does have a suggestion. A suggestion that local police forces be given more manpower. For it has been repeated history that where a municipality has raised the number of police, it has simultaneously lowered the number of crimes. You, as a citizen, can help see to it that your local police force is strengthened. Can help see to it that this year shall be a year of victory for the people over their common enemy, the criminal. Tonight's file opens in a Midwestern city. It is early afternoon. On the main street of this community, a blue sedan is cruising slowly. The woman driving turns to the two men seated beside her. Ain't no place to park, Clint. Go around the block again. Seems like we have this trouble every time we come into town. Hey, hold it, Sarah. There's somebody for now. Oh, good. What time is it, Willie? Uh, it's uh, ten before three. How am I doing? Okay. That's it. More, Willie. Right. Got a nickel for the parking meter? Yep. We'll be right back, Sarah. I'll be here. Seems a shame to waste a nickel on this. Better. Since getting in trouble with the law. There's a boy with papers, Clint. Yeah, I see him. X, X, the big fire uptown. Read all about it. This paper, mister? Yeah, give me all you got. All of them? That's right. Gee, what a break. Yeah, here's a $20 bill. Oh, I ain't got change for that. There's a bank, Clint. Why don't we go in there and change it? Okay. Come on, son. You too, Willie. Mister, what do you want with all the papers? Got my picture in them. Well, no kidding. How come? Best farmer in Harris County. All right, go ahead, both of you. Okay. All right. You can get change at that window there. Never mind that. Come here, you. Huh? Stand still. Start talking, Willie. All right, everybody, just stay put. This is a stick-up. Anybody moves a peg, this boy gets shot. A short time later, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Bill Hudson. Hi, Bill. Hello, Jim. Welcome back. Thanks. How is Washington? Oh, just about the same. 
But you know, you never realize how much you need that retraining period. <laughs> None of us do to retake it. Well, how was it back here? Busy. And we're working on a new one that came in this afternoon. Oh? What is it? Bank job. The Porter National. We just stuck up about closing time today. Mm. Anyone been there? Yeah, I just got back. Two men used the newsboy as a shield. They took almost $20,000. Well, technique sounds familiar. Well, it was used by Clinton and Willie Fleming six months ago at that bank up in Jonesboro. Oh, yeah, And sure. from the descriptions we've got, it seems it was the same boys. How did they get away? Car driven by a woman. No idea who she is, though. Do you think we might find out from their records? Yeah, we could. I didn't ask copies on the way. Or uh, one other thing. One of the Flemings was shot by a bank guard during the escape. How bad? Well, from the trail of blood, my guess is he caught a fat one. That means the doctor. Yeah. I have a list here of every doctor in the vicinity, Bill. Let's cut it in half and alert all of them. Sidewalk is full of police. Willie stopped eight bullets. Inside of two months, he was perky than ever. Did he have the same doctor? One we're going to now? No, I don't know this fella. Then why are you going to him? Because he's the closest. When you got a bullet from the law and you, you can't be choosy. Who told you about him? Friend of mine. Clint? What? If this doctor don't know us, maybe he won't take care of Willie. You take care of him. How do you know? Because we've got a gun. Say, Jim, on this list of doctors... Oh, you can forget that, Bill. Huh? My call came in from my resident agent in Thomasville. The police there located the getaway car. In Thomasville? On the outskirts. There was blood on the back seat, fingerprints all over the car. Yeah, they didn't happen to leave the loot, too, did they? No, they... Oh, pardon me, though. Sure, sir. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yeah, Frank. What? Wait, will you... Wait till I take it down. Okay, shoot. Station wagon. License number... 5231... Hey, that last number on 9? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, got it. Broken right front headlight. Yeah. Right away. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Bye. That was the resident agent again. What did he have? The Flemings abandoned their getaway car, all right, but they stole a station wagon and kept going. How did he come up with that? A trail of blood that led from the getaway car to the lot where the station wagon was parked. Come on, let's get down to the teletype room and send on the alarm. <laughs> Over there, Clint. I see it up. Put Willie down. Didn't you hear me? 
I don't want any part of this. Oh, yeah. I'm asking you to leave nicely. Now, all right, Willie right. boy. You're all right now. Listen. Tend to listen him, Sarah. Here. Sure. Won't you please listen to me? You listen to me. This boy's got bullets in him. I want you to take him out. Right. I can't. We got money. I'll pay you. It's not that. I I just couldn't do it. Why not? Well, look at my hands. Look at him. You think they could hold a knife? Clint, he's right. We better go someplace else. There ain't no place else. Now, listen to me. You no, 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 no. You're going to get in shape so you can fix Willie. Stop. Stop. Here. Stop. Stop. Here. Stop it. Stop it. No. Why do you hit me for? Sarah. Yes? I didn't do it. Find it the kitchen. Idea. Take some coffee. Leave He's going to sober up and get them bullets out of Willie. So, how about it, Doc? Well, if I, if I could have just one drink. Oh, no. What about that stuff you gave Willie? What'll be wearing off? Not for quite a while. All right, come on, Doc. Get started on them bullets. But I tell you, come I... Come on. I, I need some help. What kind? Uh, see the instruments? Yeah. Uh, hand them to me one at a time as I ask for them. So start over here and work down. I can do that, Clint. Okay. All right, get started, Doc. Very well. Scalpel. Which one's that? The uh, top one. Just remember, start at the top and work down. Oh, here you are. What's that bag moving up and down? It helps him breathe. Oh. Forceps. These? Yes. How is he, Doc? He's pretty weak. Sponge forceps. This right? Yeah. Hey. He's breathing good. Mm -hmm. Adrenaline, quick. That that needle over there. Here. Yeah. Go. Hold his arm. Like this? Yeah, that's it. Willie. Willie. Doc? What's that mean? He's dead. <gasps> Willie's dead? That's right. Then suppose you keep him company. <laughs> just a moment to this exciting file which shows how your FBI helps protect the security of America. Now a quick look at the future of America. As it enters the second half of the 20th century, economists predict there is every indication that the 1950s will prove to be the most prosperous decade our country has yet experienced. Television sets as widely distributed as radios now are. Helicopter planes as common and safe as motor cars today. Prefabricated homes, new electronic servants. These are a few of the new industries that will make the America of the 1950s more than ever the land of opportunity. If you believe in America's future, and more important, if you believe in your own future, then you will be interested in a special type of life insurance offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Life insurance for men and women on the way up. To men and women who are determined to get ahead, this plan offers three important advantages. First, as your salary goes up, your insurance can keep pace with it. When you get that better job or that big promotion comes your way, you can adjust your insurance to measure up to your increased income. Second, while you're waiting, your wife and children have the life insurance protection they need. This means that you have the peace of mind, the freedom from worry about your family that's essential to a man who wants to concentrate on getting ahead. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit. 
and offers you many desirable options, which your Equitable Society representative will be glad to explain to you. So why not get in touch with him right away? Phone him and ask for full details on the Equitable Plan for People on the Way Up. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Delinquent Doctor. The two brothers in tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation may appear to those unfamiliar with the world of crime to be unusual criminals. Unusual because they are not the products of a big city slum. The fact, however, is that men like the Flemings and women like Sarah Fleming become lawbreakers not because of their environment, but because of their outlook on life. Because of their attitude that anyone who works for a living is wasting time. It would be idle to deny that slums do breed crime and that the nation would be far better off without them. But it is equally true that many of our front-page criminals, the John Dillingers, the Alvin Coppices, the Mob Barkers, came from the small towns of the nation. They never knew what the word slum meant. And yet they became the most dangerous, the most keenly hunted criminals in the history of your FBI. Every criminal, big or small, is a human being with all the individual facets every person has. But while they enjoy a multitude of differences, they also have one thing in common. The criminal viewpoint. The belief that becomes a conviction that they can get away with it. Can get away with anything. Up to and including murder. Tonight's file continues the next day at the FBI field office. Bill, how soon can you leave here? Well, where are we going? The airport. Well, who's coming in? Nobody. We're going out to Central City. Oh? What for? That station wagon the Flemings took last night has been located. How about the Flemings? No, they were gone. The car was found in the driveway of an ex-doctor named George Adams. George Adams? Yeah, he lost his license several years ago for trying to alter a fugitive's fingerprints. Oh, yeah, I remember. Did the police question him? No, they couldn't. He was found with a bullet in his chest. We're going to interview him if he regains consciousness. What time does our plane leave? In uh, 40 minutes. We should just about make it. Will you quit that, Sarah? I can't. That's my husband laying there dead in the back seat. My brother, my favorite brother. Too bad you didn't think of that before you'd done it. Done what? Took him into that bank. Wait a minute. You saying this is my fault? He wanted to quit. You wouldn't let him. Look, don't you go start no talk like that. He couldn't wait to bust in that bank. I can still hear him talking. I'm a husband now. I need money for Sarah. Lots of money. That's what he said. But don't you go start no talk like that, you hear? The main thing we got to do now is get Willie to your farm and get him buried. You asking your folks? Asking them what? To come to the funeral. Funeral? Are you crazy, woman? We're just going to dig a hole in the ground. But that ain't proper. Us winding up in jail wouldn't be proper either. Willie's going in the ground, right back of your farm. You and me are going to be preacher, Paul Bear, and mourners at the grave. <laughs> Do you feel well enough to talk? Yes, sir. I do. What can you tell us about last night? Well, this man, Fleming, came to my home. He was with his brother and and a woman. What time was this? I, I don't know. See, I, I've been drinking quite heavily. Did you know the Flemings? No. In fact, I... I refused them, but 
They brought it away in. What made them come to you? A man named Joe Cleveland told them about me. They took a bullet out of him two years ago. Mm -hmm. that, that's the last time I associated with any of them. But you did perform an operation on Willie Fleming. Yes. That's the point of a gun. One slight digression. Do you own a car, Mr. Evans? Yes. You'll... You'll find it in my garage. I understand it's gone. Fleming must have taken it, sir. Can you describe your car for us? Uh, my... My wallet's right there on the table. It contains my registration. Fine. Hey, Jim, why don't I take this and call the police? Have them send out an alarm. Okay, Bill. All right, I'll see you later. All right. Mr. Adams, before you were shot, did you hear Fleming say anything about where he and the woman were going? No. Can you remember any of their conversation? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I... I do recall one thing. After I'd been shot, I was laying on the floor. I still have consciousness. I heard Fleming say to the woman, we're taking Willie out of here. We're going to bury him back on the farm. Did he say where the farm was? Uh, I, I don't really recall. Anything else? Can you think of anything that was said before you were shot? No, I, I'm afraid not. I, all, I, all I can remember is... Is un undressing Fleming operating Wait on Wait a minute. You say you took off his clothes? Yeah. Are they still at your home? I don't know. Oh, I think I should get out there and see. Bill. Yeah, Jim. Come out with you. I found Fleming's clothes. Oh, that's a break. Anything in them? I haven't looked yet. Let's see. Well, this label on the jacket is from a store in Watkins Grove. Yeah. I came up with something. I don't yeah. know whether it means anything. What is it? This uh, wedding ring. Ah? Uh -huh. I found it on the sink in that room Adams used for the operation. There's an inscription, you see. Uh, hmm? M.W. to R.D.W. 12314. M.W. R.D.W. Well, those initials don't tie in with anyone in this case. No. 1914 was a long time ago. Well, I'll check with Doc Adams, see what he can tell us about it. All right. You seem to be coming up with empty pockets. Yeah. Well, that's all of them. Bill, let's get back to the hospital. Okay. I'll put in a call to the Watkins Grove police. This jacket came from there, so maybe they'll know something about the Fleming brothers. <laughs> I tried to see the doc about that wedding ring, but he couldn't be disturbed. How did you make out? I contacted the Watkins Grove police. They knew the Flemings. They used to live there, but they moved away five years ago. Any lead on where they might have gone? They didn't have any, but they gave me the name of a local resident who'd been friendly with the Flemings. I've got a call in for him now. I'll see if he has any lead on where they might have gone. <laughs> Bill, I talked to that guy who knew the Flemings. Any luck? Some. He hadn't seen them in two years, but he'd heard from them. Willie Fleming got married a month ago to a girl named Sarah Williams. Ah, she's the one that traveled with him. Sounds like it. I learned that they were living on a farm up in Elm County, a farm that the girl had inherited when her parents died. Any address? No, I've got to call in now for the county agent. You got anything, Jim? Nothing encouraging. The county agent said Elm County was settled by a family named Williams, and half the people up there now have that name. It'll take weeks to check all of them. Well, Jim, I talked to the doc. He'd never seen the ring. He figured it must have belonged to the woman. But she washed her hands just before the operation. Phil, let me see that ring again, will you? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah, sure it belongs to her. Come on, let's get up to Elm County. Ain't you never going to quit that... I can't help it. Willie in the ground. You throwing dirt on it. No. Clint. What? Ain't you putting up a marker? No. 
Why not? I don't want nobody digging him up again. Now, who dig him up? The law, that's who. Yeah, that does it. Let's go inside. I don't want to. Now, look, I don't want you mooning out here. I'm never going back in there. As soon as I get my money, I'm going away. What money? What you took from the bank. You get nothing from that. I get Willie's half. I'm his widow. I don't figure that way. You mean to keep it all, Clint? That's right. Well, let me tell you something. You ain't never going to get to spend it. Why not? Because I'll tell the law on you, that's why. I'll tell them it was you that stuck up the bank. Well, now, I bet you just would. Sure. I think I got a way of stopping that. Oh, hey, go on, me. Sarah, I ain't letting go. Hey, you are, Clinton. Who are you? The special agents of the FBI. They're both under arrest. <laughs> Because the former Dr. Adams subsequently died in the hospital, Clint and Sarah Fleming were found guilty and sentenced in the federal court. Sarah to life imprisonment and Clint to execution. The clue that led Special Agents Taylor and Hudson to the bank robber's hideout was the inscription in the wedding ring found at the doctor's home. The inscription that read MW to RDW, 12314. Having established that the ring belonged to the girl, a ring commemorating a marriage way back in 1914. Taylor correctly assumed that it was her parents' ring that she was now wearing. Her family name being Williams, Taylor checked the records in the Elm County Courthouse for marriages in 1914 on the date of the inscription. This then disclosed the address of the Williams farmhouse. And thus, two special agents of your FBI, aided by local police, were able to close the file on three dangerous criminals, to close Willie Fleming's by stamping the word dead across the face of it, and to close the other two with the frequently used stamp that bears the single word every criminal fears. The single word, convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting FBI file. Now one last word on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. It's a plan for the man who's confident that someday soon, his boss is going to call him in and say, Ed, you've been doing a great job. An outstanding job. From now on, you're in charge of your department. If you're that kind of man, then the sooner you get in touch with an Equitable Society representative, the better. Ask him for full information on the Equitable Society's life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual recount of a thrilling manhunt. Its subject, attempted murder. Its title, a license to kill. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Herb Ellis, Bill Johnstone... Charlotte Lawrence, Charles Maxwell, John McIntyre, and Dick Monahan. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A license to kill on... This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.